If you ever thought about starting your own podcast, you should check out Riverside. Riverside is an online recording studio that lets you record podcasts and video in studio quality from anywhere. And if you click on the affiliated link in the episode description and you buy a subscription, you will also be supporting the podcast. And if you are going to start your own podcast or you just want to continue to listen to great podcasts, you're going to need headphones or speakers. If you click on the Amazon affiliated link, you can get great deals on headphones and speakers. And if you make a purchase, it will also help support the podcast. And if you ever want to read a book I have mentioned on this podcast, I now have an affiliated link for Bookshop. All the affiliated links that I mentioned will be in the episode description for this episode. This is just a reminder that this podcast has merch and a Patreon, and if you could contribute to one of those to help keep this podcast going, I would greatly appreciate it. In the Louvre hangs a portrait. It is arguably the most famous portrait ever. Possibly the most famous painting ever. No one knows for sure who this portrait is of. Some even can't decide if the woman in the portrait is smiling or not. But it seems fitting that Mona Lisa would be a woman of mystery, for the man that painted her also lived a life of somewhat of a mystery. Hi, my name is Courtney Jewell, and you are listening to the third episode of the fourth season of History Show, a podcast about history that proves that sometimes fact is even more interesting than fiction. We are in season four of History Show, and this season is titled They Are a Rainbow. This season of History Show, I will be covering each week a historical figure that was a part of the LGBTQIA community. These were people that, during their time, they had to hide a part of their identity from the world. So while I fully believe that those who were out and proud in their lifetime, even if it had the potential to cost them everything, deserve to be praised and recognized, those are not the people that I will be covering this season. I am covering the ones that were made to love in the shadows. The ones that had to lie to most or all of the people around them. Now, I know that sexual orientation and gender identity are complex. And some of the terms that I will use to describe these subjects were not around in some of their lifetimes. So, some of these subjects obviously wouldn't have used the same words to describe themselves as I will be using. But, I don't want to get too hung up on my wording. I just want to celebrate a part of these individuals that, in their time, there was pressure all around them to feel shame about. I want to focus on that love and gender are not black and white. They are a rainbow. And for this week, I am talking about Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a lot of things in his life. He was a painter, draftsman, sculptor, architect, engineer, scientist, theorist, and possibly a gay icon? Let's dive deeper to find out. Leonardo was born on April 15, 1452 in Acano, Republic of Florence. The Republic of Florence is today in the country of Italy. At the time of Leonardo's birth, Italy was not a country. Italy wouldn't become a country until 1861. His full name was Leonardo di Sarpiero da Vinci. His father was Sarpiero, and he was a Florentine notary and landlord. And his mother was named Caterina, and she was a peasant woman. Leonardo's parents were never married to each other. Leonardo's mother married an artisan named Antonio Buti di Piero del Vaccia who was called Atacabriga. There is also a theory out there that Caterina was a slave, but this theory is highly unlikely. 
If it is true, though, that means that Leonardo had some Arab roots. Some see the fact that Leonardo applied for a position at the court of the Ottoman Sultan as proof that he was trying to reconnect with his roots. But it could have been just an attempt at a building project. In 1503, he wanted to build a bridge to connect Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, to the other side of the Golden Horn and the Near East by land. This bridge would have been the longest bridge in the world. We don't know the Sultan's response, and it appears that Leonardo never stepped foot in Istanbul. Leonardo had 17 half-siblings. His mother gave him five siblings. Piero was born around 1454. Maria was born around 1457. Elisabetta was born around 1459. Francesco was born around 1461. And Sandra was born around 1463. Leonardo's father was married four times, and he had a thing for younger women. His first wife was named... Adabiera, and Leonardo's father married her shortly after Leonardo's birth. Adabiera di Giovanni Amadori was 15 years old when she married Leonardo's father, and Leonardo's father was 25. Leonardo was probably very close to Adabiera. He remained close to her family after her death. It is possible that Leonardo's father had an affair with Leonardo's mother while he was engaged to Adabiera. Adabiera died by 1464. In 1465, Leonardo's father married a woman named Francesca di Sar Giovanni Lanvedini. Francesca was 16 at the time of her marrying his father and... Leonardo's father was 39. Francesca died in 1475. Sarfiero then married Margarita di Francesco di Jacopo di Grelmo. She was 18 years old. Sarfiero and Margarita had six children together. Antonio was born in 1476. Magdalena was born in 1477. Giuliano was born in 1479. Lorenzo was born in 1484. Violente was born in 1485. And Domenico was born in 1486. Sarpiero married his fourth and last wife in 1486. Her name was Lucrezia di Grelmo Cortigiani. She was 22 years old. Together, they had children Margarita, born in 1491, Benedito, born in 1492, Pandorfo, born in 1494, Guelmo, born in 1496, Bartolomeo, born in 1497, and Giovanni, born in 1498. I could only find information on the death of one of Leonardo's siblings, and that was his brother, Francesco, and he was probably killed during the siege of Pisa by the Republic of Florence. Leonardo grew up on his father's family estate. We don't know his relationship that he had with his mother growing up, but he did live close to where she lived, so it's possible that he was able to see her from time to time. We do know that he wrote to his mother, but it's impossible to determine what kind of relationship that they had from the letters because not a lot of the letters have survived. In 1494, his mother died of a change or exchange fever. I don't know what a change or exchange fever is. I searched to try and figure it out, but I wasn't able to find anything. So if you know, I would appreciate it if you would let me know. 
Leonardo paid for his mother's funeral and he took care of her for the last three years of her life after her husband died. So even if they didn't have a close relationship when he was growing up, it appears that they had one when he was an adult. Leonardo's father made sure that Leonardo had an education. He was taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, though it appears that when he was younger, he didn't take his education too seriously. He didn't take Latin or higher mathematics seriously until later in life, around the age of 30. Which is proof that you are never too old to learn, even if you didn't like learning when you were younger. Leonardo lived with his paternal grandparents while his father was away in Florence. And Leonardo's grandparents also accepted him even though he was illegitimate. That was actually quite common for this time and place. Illegitimate children were accepted by their community. They were raised by their father's family. And Leonardo's grandfather, Antonio da Vinci, is how we know Leonardo's birthday because he wrote it in a diary of his that Leonardo was born on Saturday, April 15th, 1452 around 11 p.m. Leonardo's grandfather died before 1465 and when he died Leonardo and Leonardo's grandmother Lucia moved to Florence with Leonardo's father. Around the age of 14 Leonardo became a studio boy in the workshop of Andrea del Verrocchio. Andrea was a leading painter and sculptor in Florence. Leonardo became his apprentice by 17 and he trained with him for seven years. Leonardo worked with Andrea on the baptism of Christ. It has been said, though this is probably not true, that Andrea put down his brush and never painted again when he saw how well Leonardo had painted the young angel holding Jesus' robe. It is possible that Leonardo was a model for Andrea's works, the Rome statue of David in Bargello, and the archangel Raphael in Tobias and the Angel. During this time, Leonardo apparently painted a shield that ended up in the possession of the Duke of Milan. It wasn't painted for the Duke of Milan, it was actually painted for a peasant. Well, a peasant had asked Leonardo's father to have him paint it for him. Leonardo was inspired by the story of Medusa and he painted a monster spitting fire onto the shield. Leonardo's father thought that it was too terrifying to give to the peasant and so he bought the peasant a new shield and he sold Leonardo's shield to a Florentine art dealer that then sold it to the Duke of Milan. In 1476 is when there is the first clue as to what Leonardo's sexuality was. Leonardo's sexuality isn't the clearest out of all of the people that I will cover this season, but I think it's fairly clear. In 1476, when Leonardo was 24, Leonardo and three other men were charged with sodomy with a male prostitute named Jacopo Saltarelli. The charges were eventually dismissed for a lack of evidence, but the lack of evidence doesn't mean that there was actually a lack of evidence. Leonardo di Tornaborni was one of the three other men that were charged with sodomy. Turner Borney was related to Lorenzo de Medici, and if you don't know who that was, he was a very influential banker. I would go into more details about Lorenzo, but I have this ever-growing list of people that I want to cover on this podcast, and I want you to know you can always send me suggestions if you like. And on my ever-growing list for some time now has been Lorenzo de Medici. 
So I definitely see a future episode of History Shelf being about Lorenzo. But for this episode, what you need to know is that he was extremely powerful and could have absolutely influenced the court to say that there was a lack of evidence. But the thing was, Leonardo kept his private life as private as he could. Perhaps it was because he was hiding his sexuality, or maybe it was because he was simply a private person. We don't know much about Leonardo's personal life. Leonardo has been described as being physically beautiful, but of course, beauty is subjective, and I feel like just about everyone from history is described as being beautiful. I have noticed that even more since I started doing this podcast. I don't know how many times I have come across something that said the person I was researching was beautiful. It's almost like to be noteworthy, you have to be beautiful. And you can take that to mean two things. Either it means that to be considered noteworthy, people in history had to first be beautiful. Or if you were noteworthy, then you also had to be beautiful because whatever you were noteworthy for wasn't enough. And beauty has often been regarded as the most important thing. So it had to be written down that you were also beautiful. The only example I can think of off of the top of my head that it was noted that they were quote unquote ugly was Anne of Cleves. But of course that came from King Henry VIII and I for sure do not trust what his judgment was. You can check out the whole first season of History Shelf if you want to know my opinion on him. That season is titled King Henry VIII's Inner Circle and the People He Was an Asshole To. Leonardo was also described as having infinite grace, and he was a lover of animals. He was probably a vegetarian, and he would buy caged birds just to set them free. On June 7th, 1476, charges for sodomy were brought up against Leonardo again with that same male prostitute. But the charges were again dropped. The charges were dropped because the accusations were not signed. Accusations of sodomy could be made in secret, but they could not be made anonymously. That was because sodomy was seen as a very serious crime. The punishment for the crime was death. Not everyone has been convinced of Leonardo's homosexuality. Art historian Raymond Stice suggested that Leonardo had a romantic relationship with Cecilia Gallerani. Cecilia was the subject of Leonardo's painting, Lady with an Ermine. Leonardo had a close friendship with Cecilia, but I personally did not find anything that made me believe that they had a romantic relationship. Though that's not to say that they didn't. But it was a well-known fact that Cecilia was the mistress of Ludovica Sforza, Duke of Milan. She was actually pregnant with the Duke's son when Leonardo painted her. But the truth is, determining what Leonardo's sexuality was is tricky. Leonardo was never married or had any children. There's no proof that he ever took a lover, so there's speculation. He made very few references about sexuality in his notebooks, but there are a couple quotes. One quote is, quote, The act of procreation and anything that has any relation to it is so disgusting that human beings would soon die out if there were no pretty faces and sensuous dispositions, end quote. Another quote he wrote is, quote, Intellectual passion drives out sensuality. Whoso curls not lustful desires puts himself on a level with the beast. End quote. These quotes and charges of sodomy are the only hints to Leonardo's sexuality that we have. So you can see why it is so hard to figure out. But despite the challenge, many people have tried. 
In her book, A History of Celibacy, Elizabeth Avcott says that Leonardo was probably homosexual, but he had trauma from the sodomy case, so he became celibate for the rest of his life. Though there are some that don't believe that he was celibate. They simply believe that he became more careful and more cautious about picking his sexual partners after the sodomy charges. Some have used Leonardo's art as evidence of his homosexuality. Many have brought up his painting titled St. John the Baptist and a drawing known as the Incarnate Angel. The drawing is of Gian Giacomo Caprotti de Orenio, better known as Salai. In this drawing, Salai is an angel with an erect penis. Now, I don't think using someone's art is a way to prove without a shadow of a doubt their sexuality. I do believe art can be separated from the artist, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the artist's life, but more times than not it does. I want to take a brief moment here and pause Leonardo's story. This is something that I wanted to make sure I said this season and now feels like as good a time as any. Some of the people that I am covering this season, their sexuality is speculative. But just because I'm speculating the sexuality of historical figures does not mean I think that it is right to project a sexuality onto a person that is alive today and they have constantly told you their sexuality. I do not think that it is right when a queer person comes out and people tell them that it is just a phase, or when a bisexual person comes out and someone tells them that they are really just straight or they're really just gay. I also do not believe the opposite is right. And we do see that a lot with artists today. Like, when a straight actor plays a gay role, their character's sexuality is often projected onto them. Taylor Swift has had this happen to her because some people have believed that they have found some secret message in her music or something that she has worn, even though she has repeatedly said that she is straight. She says that she is straight, but an ally. With Leonardo, he is not alive today. He hasn't been alive for centuries, and he didn't write down that he was a straight man, or that he wasn't a straight man. But I don't think that it is alright to publicly speculate on an alive person's sexuality. Because, best case scenario, you are wrong about their sexuality, and now you've made them feel uncomfortable. Or, worst case scenario, you're right. And they are queer. And now they feel like they have to come out of the closet, even if they aren't ready. Like with what happened with Kit Connor and Billie Eilish and other public figures. So, I just wanted to make my stance on that very clear before I went on. I want to go back and talk about Sally E. Sally E was an artist and pupil of Leonardo. Leonardo was known to be very fond of him. Were they lovers? Maybe. In 1490, a year after Salai had lived with Leonardo as his assistant, Leonardo made a list that called Salai a thief, a liar, stubborn, and a glutton. This was after Salai had taken off with money and valuables at least five different times. When he would take off with Leonardo's money and valuables, he would spend it on clothes. But Leonardo still kept him around and indulged him, and he stayed in Leonardo's household for the next 30 years. That to me sounds more like a romantic relationship than it does a friendship, but that is just me going off of a feeling, so I could be wrong. That is all the details I can give you on Leonardo's sexuality. I do think that there is a great possibility that Leonardo was gay, obviously, or he wouldn't be on this season. But I can't give you a definitive answer. Now back to the other aspects of Leonardo's life. In 1472, Leonardo qualified as a master in the Guild of St. Luke. That was a guild for artists. Leonardo's father gave him his own workshop, but because Leonardo was so fond of Andre del Verrocchio, he continued to work and live with him. 
Leonardo's earliest known dated work is in 1473, and it is a pen and ink drawing of the Arno Valley. I'm not going to mention all of Leonardo's artworks because there were a lot of them, so we would be here for a while. But I will mention the really important ones. Leonardo was apparently the first person to suggest making the Arno River a navigable channel between Florence and Pisa. Leonardo moved from Florence to Milan to offer his skills and services to the Duke of Milan, Ludovica Sforza. In 1482, he was sent to the Duke as an ambassador by Lorenzo de Medici. He worked in Milan from 1482 to 1499. During this time, Leonardo was commissioned to paint, among other works, his arguably second most famous work, The Last Supper, for the monastery of Santa Maria della Grazia. In 1485, Leonardo went to Hungary on behalf of the Duke to meet King Matthias Corvinus, and he was commissioned by him to paint a Madonna. Leonardo created many projects for the Duke of Milan, like preparations of floats and pageants, more special occasions, a drawing, and a wooden model for a competition to design the cupola for the Milan Cathedral. A cupola is a small, dome-like tall structure on the top of a building. Leonardo was also commissioned to make a huge equestrian monument for Ludovica's predecessor and father, Francesco Sforza. It became known as Leonardo's horse, Sforza's horse, and the Gran Cavadio, which means great horse. It was going to be the largest equestrian statue in the world, but it was never made. Only a clay model was made, and even that no longer exists today. The clay model was used as an archery target by French soldiers when they invaded Milan in 1499 at the beginning of the Second Italian War, and it was destroyed by rains and freezes. The war was the reason why the statue was never casted. Leonardo wrote that he was ready to begin the casting process on December 20th, 1493. But in November of 1495, Ludovica gave the bronze to his father-in-law, Ercole d'Este, to forge cannons to defend the city against King Charles VIII of France. Though drawings of the horse statue have survived and they have influenced horse statues all around the world. The horse statue never being casted gave fuel to Leonardo's rival, Michelangelo. I'm sure Michelangelo needs no introduction, but in case you're unfamiliar with him, he was responsible for the statue of David and the painting of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo insulted Leonardo by implying that he was unable to cast it. Some men were debating a passage in Dante. I assume that is referring to Dante's Inferno, but I'm unsure. Anyway, the men asked Leonardo to explain the passage for them. Michelangelo was there, and Leonardo said that Michelangelo would be able to explain it. Michelangelo's reply was, quote, No, you explain it. You who have undertaken the design of a horse to be cast in bronze, but were unable to cast it, and were forced to give up in shame, and to think you were believed by those castrated Milanese roosters, end quote. This little incident was not the first encounter between Leonardo and Michelangelo. They first met when Leonardo was put on a committee to decide where Michelangelo's statue, the famous David, would be placed. In 1503, Leonardo was commissioned to paint a huge mural depicting the Battle of Anghiari. Michelangelo was to join him and paint the Battle of Cascina. Leonardo and Michelangelo had a difference of opinions, and because of this, they never did paint the council hall. In 1500, Ludovica was overthrown by France. Leonardo then fled to Venice. Leonardo fled with his pupil and possible lover, Salai, which I forgot to mention earlier that Leonardo was the one that gave Salai his nickname. The nickname came from Salina, which means the devil's name. 
Leonardo also fled with a mathematician named Luca Pacioli. There in Venice, Leonardo became a military architect and engineer. He devised methods to defend the city from naval attacks. Leonardo didn't stay there long, and he moved back to Florence before the year was over. He stayed at the monastery of Santissima Anna Lucia, and he was given a workshop there. And it was there that he created the cartoon of the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist. And this was a hit, and people flocked to see it. In 1502, Leonardo entered into the service of Cesare Borgia. He was one of the sons of Pope Alexander VI. The Borgias were an interesting family, and I definitely plan to cover at least one of Pope Alexander VI's children on this podcast. Leonardo traveled all around the country that we know today as Italy as Cesare's military architect and engineer. In 1503, he left Cesare's service and he returned back to Florence. That was when Leonardo started one of his paintings. It is a painting that you may have heard of before. The painting is called The Mona Lisa. Who the Mona Lisa is a portrait of is a mystery. It is quite possibly Lisa del Wacondo. Leonardo's father knew Lisa's husband, Francesca del Wacondo, and it has been proven that Leonardo was working on a portrait of Lisa. But is the most famous painting in the world, in all of history, Lisa's portrait? We will probably never know. Over the centuries, many have tried to guess the identity of this mystery person in the painting. The names that people have thrown out there have been Isabella of Aragon, Cecilia Gallerani, Costanda de la Valls, Duchess of Francavilla, Pacifica Brandano or Brandino, Isabella Guolando. Caterina Sforza, Bianca Giovanni Sforza, Leonardo's mother, Salai, and even Leonardo himself. On October 18, 1503, Leonardo rejoined the Guild of St. Luke. On July 9, 1504, Leonardo's father died. Leonardo's father did not specifically mention Leonardo in his will. Now, remember, Leonardo was Sarpiero's illegitimate son. So that meant that legally Leonardo was entitled to nothing. Leonardo's brother, Domenico, fought Leonardo over his inheritance. And because Leonardo was illegitimate, Domenico won. Leonardo received nothing from his father after his death. It seems this may have caused a little bad blood between the two brothers, we know this because a letter that Leonardo sent his brother still survives to this day. In the letter, Leonardo sarcastically congratulated his brother on the birth of his heir. Charles II de Waz, the acting French governor of Milan, summoned Leonardo in 1506. That was when Leonardo took another pupil named Count Francesco Melzi. He is considered to be Leonardo's favorite student. Francesco followed Leonardo around until Leonardo's death. Francesco was the one that inherited most of Leonardo's estate and works. Leonardo and Francesco may have been lovers, or it may have been more of a father-son type of relationship. Like I said earlier, picking apart Leonardo's personal life is tough. I think it is even tougher than King Edward II and that is understandable since sodomy was a crime punishable by death in Leonardo's time and he didn't have the power that King Edward II had. And even with all of his power, look how well Edward's story turned out. If you listened to the first two episodes of this season, then you know it did not end well. The Council of Florence wanted Leonardo to finish the Battle of Anghiari. But instead of doing that, he was given leave by King Louis XII of France. The king considered having Leonardo make some portraits. King Louis XII is someone that I have mentioned before on this podcast. I mentioned him in season one in the Mary Tudor, Queen of France episode. He was Mary's first husband. 
Leonardo possibly may have commenced a project for an equestrian figure of Charles II Dubois. A wax model of this horse survives, and if this really is Leonardo's work, then it is the only example of Leonardo's sculpture that exists today. Leonardo had an uncle. He was a brother of Leonardo's father. His name was Francesco, and Leonardo was very close to this uncle. They both had a strong love for nature. Francesco died in 1507, and he died childless. Francesco had made Leonardo his heir. Leonardo's brother, Giuliano, fought him on his inheritance that Francesco left him. This time around, though, it was different than when Leonardo's father died. Because this time, Leonardo used his political connections, and he was able to get his inheritance. Leonardo went to Rome after Lorenzo de Medici's son Giovanni became Pope Leo X. The Pope had given Leonardo a painting commission, but that was cancelled when Leonardo set out to develop a new kind of varnish. Then Leonardo became sick. It is possible that he had multiple strokes. Leonardo had become good friends with King Francis I of France. In 1516, Leonardo entered into Francis's service, and the king gave him the use of the manor house Clolucy. It was close to the king's residence. While in the service of Francis, Leonardo made a mechanical lion for him that walked towards Francis during a pageant. And when it was struck with a wand, its chest opened and it revealed a cluster of lilies. Leonardo's right hand became paralyzed when he was 65, and this could have been why he left some of his work, like the Mona Lisa, unfinished. Eventually, Leonardo's health got too bad for him to work, and he was bedridden for the last several months of his life. On May 2nd, 1519, Leonardo died at Clos Lucy. He possibly died of a stroke. He was 67 years old. On his deathbed, it had been said that Leonardo said, quote, He had offended against God and men by failing to practice his art as he should have done. End quote. Legend has it that King Francis I held Leonardo's head in his arms as Leonardo died. Twenty years after Leonardo died, it was reported that Francis had said, quote, there had never been another man born in the world who knew as much as Leonardo, not so much about painting, sculpture, and architecture, as that he was a very great philosopher. End quote. In Leonardo's will, Francesco Melzi was the principal heir and executor. He got money, Leonardo's paintings, tools, library, and personal items. Salai and his servant Battista di Bellinese each got half of Leonardo's vineyards. Leonardo's brothers got land, and Leonardo's serving woman got a fur-lined cloak. In his will, Leonardo said that he wanted 60 beggars carrying tapers following his casket. On August 12, 1519, Leonardo was laid to rest in the Colleghette Church of St. Florentine at the Chateau du Bois. During the French Revolution, the Chateau de Bois was damaged. The church had to be demolished in 1802 because of this. Some of the graves were destroyed and Leonardo's remains were lost in the process. But in 1863, someone named Arsene Ose may have found them. He found a partially completed skeleton with a bronze ring on one finger and it had white hair. The skull's eight teeth corresponds with someone around Leonardo's age. A silver shield near the bones had a beardless King Francis I. That is how he looked when Leonardo died. And there were stone fragments that had the letters E-O, A-R, G-U-S, and V-I-N-C. So that possibly could stand for Leonardus Vinci. The skull was reinterred in the chapel of St. Hubbard in 1874. 
A plaque above the tomb says that the remains are presumed to be Leonardo's. DNA is being compared to samples left on Leonardo's work and that of Leonardo's half-brother Domenico's descendants to see if the remains are in fact Leonardo's. I will keep you informed if anything comes of that. Arson Ose took the ring that he found along with a lock of the skeleton's hair. In 1925, these items were sold to an American collector. But as of May 2nd, 2019, the items are being displayed at the Leonardo Museum in Vinci. Though I think a lot of people probably see Leonardo as a painter first and foremost, and he did contribute a lot to the world of art. Francesco Melzi put together Leonardo's study on anatomy, light, and the landscape. It was published as a treatise on painting, and it is seen as the precursor of French academic thought on art. But being a painter wasn't the only thing Leonardo was. Leonardo was into science. His writings on fossils influenced early paleontology. Leonardo liked to study anatomy. He was given permission to dissect human corpses at the Hospital of Santa Maria Nuova in Florence and also in hospitals in Milan and Rome. He made one of the first scientific drawings of a fetus in utero. All of his drawings of the human anatomy were ahead of their time. And if they had been published, they would have made a major contribution to medical science. But he didn't just stick to drawing the anatomy of humans. He also dissected and drew cows, birds, monkeys, bears, frogs, and horses. He was the first to define atherosclerosis and liver cirrhosis. He created models of cerebral ventricles with melted wax. And he made a glass aorta. And he used water and grass seeds to observe blood flow separation. In 1493, Leonardo wrote in his notebooks the laws of sliding friction. His findings, though, were never published. And so, Gelman Monson, who rediscovered the friction laws in 1699, is now associated with the friction laws despite Leonardo finding them 206 years before him. Leonardo was also an engineer. When he was in Venice, he made a system of movable barricades to protect the city from attack. He also diverted the flow of the Arno River. Leonardo was also an inventor. He had many drawings of inventions. He had a particular fondness for flying machines, but he had a wide range of inventions that included musical instruments, a mechanical knight, hydraulic pumps, reversible crank mechanisms, finned mortar shells, and a steam cannon. In 2003, a documentary called Leonardo's Dream Machines and a TV series in 2009 titled Doing Da Vinci tested out some of Leonardo's inventions. And while not every one of his inventions were successful, some were. Mark Vandenbroek, an artist and sculptor, revealed that more than 100 of Leonardo's inventions were not actually his inventions, but rather improvements of older prototypes from different cultures and different times. But as I mentioned earlier, Leonardo is mostly known for his paintings. Something that he did with his paintings that I haven't mentioned yet was he put hidden messages in some of them. Yes, that part of the Da Vinci Code was real. Though, I highly doubt that cracking his code is going to lead you to the Holy Grail. In the right eye of the Mona Lisa are Leonardo's initials LV. There is also a possible hidden musical melody in the painting The Last Supper. If you draw five lines of the staff across the painting, the apostles' hands and the loaves of bread on the table are in the positions of the music notes. The music is meant to be read from right to left, in case you're curious and musically inclined. Leonardo has left behind a legacy. I'm sure before you started listening to this episode, you knew who Leonardo da Vinci was. There have been people that I have covered on this podcast that I'm sure that you have not heard of them before. But Leonardo is definitely one of the most famous subjects that I've covered so far. And even if you hadn't heard of him before, 
there's a good chance that you have heard about, or at the very least seen, some of his art. The Mona Lisa is the most famous portrait in history, like I said in the intro. The Last Supper is the most reproduced religious painting of all time. And Leonardo's Vitruvian Man is considered a cultural icon. Leonardo and or his works have popped up quite a bit in pop culture. Probably the most popular was the Dan Brown book I mentioned earlier titled The Da Vinci Code. It was also made into a film. There are some other novels and short stories that have mentioned Leonardo and or his works. The Romance of Leonardo da Vinci by Dmitry Mirovsky, The Second Mrs. Gracondo by E.L. Koenigsberg, Leonardo da Vinci Detective by Theodore Matheson, Pasquale's Angel by Paul J. Macaulay, The Memory Cathedral by Jack Dunn, Pilgrim by Timothy Finley, Renaissance, The Medici Guns, The Medici Emerald, and The Medici Hawks by Martin Woodhouse, Black Madonna by Carl Sargent and Mark Gascoigne, The Medici Seal by Teresa Breslin, The Door into Summer by Robert Heinlein, Saturn's Apprentice by M. L. Lang, and he is in the Assassin's Creed books, Assassin's Creed Renaissance, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, and Assassin's Creed Revelations. Also, Crawley in the book Good Omen owns the original sketch of the Mona Lisa. He has appeared in the films Leonardo da Vinci, The Life of Leonardo da Vinci, Nothing Left to Do But Cry, Quest of the Delta Knights, Leonardo da Vinci Canimated, Ever After, Christy Mallory's own double entry, The Virgins of Sherwood Forest, Leonardo, Mr. Peabody in Sherman, Leo da Vinci, Mission Mona Lisa, and The Inventor. His works are mentioned in the films Hudson Hawk, the Da Vinci Treasures, The Three Musketeers, The Lost Leonardo. The plays Leonardo's Last Supper and Daedalus are about Leonardo. And so was the opera called Leonardo Dreams of His Flying Machine. Panic at the Disco has a song titled The Ballad of Mona Lisa. Christopher has a song titled Why Mona Lisa Smiled. Elton John has a song called Mona Lisa and Mad Hatters, and Carly Rae Jepsen has a song titled Fake Mona Lisa. James Labrie's album Leonardo, The Absolute Man, is about Leonardo's life and works. An American pop and R&B singer, Kimberly Ledbetter, goes by the stage name Mona Lisa, and Leonardo is in the Red Hot Chili Peppers music video for Californication. There are way too many TV shows about him or that have mentioned him or his works to list them all, but I will list a few of them. He was in an episode of Doctor Who. He was mentioned on the shows Futurama and Family Guy. The BBC had a series called Leonardo that was about Leonardo's teenage years, and the guy that plays Leonardo is Jonathan Bailey. He is the guy that plays Anthony on Bridgerton and Tim on Fellow Travelers. There was also a series called Da Vinci's Demons. It was really good, but it is a historical fantasy. So obviously it's not completely historically accurate, but that wasn't the vibe that they were going for. I know in the show Leonardo was not gay. I can't remember if he was straight or if he was bisexual or pansexual. But I do remember that his main love interest was a woman. There was also a series in 2021 titled Leonardo. Leonardo has appeared in many comic strips and graphic novels like DC Comics Elseworlds and Marvel Shield, among others. He is in the video games Mario's Time Machine, The Journeyman Project 2 Buried in Time, Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends, Scalibur Legends, Scribblenauts, Civilization, Assassin's Creed 2, and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Super Monday Night Combat, Little Big Planet 
to Fate slash Grand Order and Totally Accurate Battle Simulator. And there is a traveling expedition with 40 full-scale machines of Leonardo's. I think because so many people have been inspired by Leonardo da Vinci, just showcases how talented he was. Leonardo and his works have stood the test of time. And Leonardo proved himself to be the very definition of of a renaissance man. And that was the life of Leonardo da Vinci. Thank you so much for listening to the third episode of the fourth season of History Shelf. I am going to be covering 15 people this season, but I have no idea how many episodes that's going to take. I didn't expect for King Edward II's story to take up two episodes, but it did. So there's a possibility that there's going to be someone else that I'm going to cover that's going to need multiple episodes. Next week's episode is going to be about William Shakespeare. I hope you come back for that. A few things before we go. If you want to follow this podcast on social media, the TikTok is at History Shelf. The Facebook page is History Shelf Podcast. The Twitter is at History Shelf Pod. And the Instagram is at History underscore Shelf underscore Pod. If you want to help out this podcast financially, there are a few ways you can do that. One is you can buy merch from the History Shelf merch store, or you can become a Patreon. This podcast is always going to be free, but there are some perks that come along with becoming a Patreon. The first tier is called History Student, and that is $1 a month. And with that, I will send out a shout out to you on all social media platforms that History Shelf is on. I will also choose one Patreon at random for each episode I do. And at the end of that episode, I will give you a shout out. The second tier is called History Fan, and that is $3 a month. And with that, you get the first tier. Plus, you get to vote in a poll that helps me choose the theme for the next season of this podcast. The third tier is called History Buff, and that is $20 a month. And with that, you get the first two tiers. Plus, you will get a handwritten note of thanks mail to you from me. And the last tier is called History Lover, and that is $40 a month. And with that, you get the first three tiers. Plus, you get to choose one item from the History Shelf merch store. You can choose any item that you want, except for the zip-up putty. You can also take out ad space on this podcast. I have a gig on Fiverr that lets you do that. Also, if you click on one of the affiliated links, there's one for Riverside, there's one for Amazon, and there's one for Bookshop. If you click on one of those links and you buy something, that also helps support the podcast. But if you don't want any of the merch or any of the perks and you don't want to buy anything but you still want to help out this podcast, I have turned on listener support on Spotify for podcasters. But as always, the best way that you can support this podcast is to just to continue to listen to it. And there are a few other ways that you can help out this podcast for free. One is if you are listening on a platform that lets you rate this podcast five stars and or leave a positive review. If you do that, that would be very helpful. Also, sharing this podcast on social media with your friends and family would be very helpful. All right. Well, until next time, keep learning, keep loving history, and come back for next week's episode.